Welcome to the talk, scipy.cpp, using AI to port Python's scipy.signal filter-related functions to C++ for use in real time. Uh, this was driven by a need to uh, do filter design in an audio plugin. So this is Plugin GUI Magic's equalizer example with some buttons mocked up here to show basically what I'm trying to do. Instead of just, you know, turning these knobs and getting your EQ how you want manually like that, um, we'd like to add an automatic fit button. And so there are a lot of methods for filter design that'll do that. And once you uh, like what you see, then you can save it out. And so I want to be able to draw whatever you want here. And you also want to be able to load a desired magnitude frequency response that's, you know, maybe measured in the wild, that sort of thing. So to, get, to do this, you need the filter design stuff to run and see in real time. Um, and where is most of our filter design software? Well, it's not in C++ as far as I know. Um, now, here's a quick lightning review of filter design. Uh, the, probably the easiest method, the most straightforward method is frequency sampling. You just draw what you want. It's a magnitude re frequency response. And the only thing tricky that mm, a lot of people don't know how to do is uh, to make it minimum phase. Because if you leave it zero phase, then when you inverse FFT, it will be non-causal. It'll be symmetric about time zero. But if you make it minimum phase, then it'll be causal, and you're also keeping it as compact in time as possible. And then you can take the inverse FFT and get the desired impulse response. And so um, now you can work in the time domain. Um, and you do have to implement in the time domain. And so that's one of the reasons we, uh, you know, we want to think in the frequency domain and implement in the time domain. Um, so then it'll be causal, but it'll probably be too long because you just drew something arbitrary. So, so what you do then is you window it with like the second, the right half of a Han window or something like that. Um, take it down to the affordable length. And windowing in the time domain is smoothing in the frequency domain. So you're going to get a smoother response. So you should actually forward FFT and make sure it's still okay. It'll be smoother yeah, after the windowing. And then, of course, we just use convolution to implement an FIR filter, you know, finite impulse response filter. And this is typical for things like amp cabinets, very, very commonly used. It's even used for reverb nowadays. We can afford it more and more. And so the only problem really with it is that it can be really expensive if you've got a lot of it going on. And, um, and in my case, I really do want to minimize the CPU load and I don't have access to the GPU. So uh, it is valuable to get it down. And so, so there are recursive methods and, um, and those are um, things like M-Freak-Z in MATLAB and Octave, but that's not C++. And so... I, you know, AI's all around. Uh, let's try the chatbots to translate something to uh, C++. And, um, and they also are good at writing unit tests. I'll show some of that. Um, but the situation for filter design is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff in MATLAB, but that's completely proprietary. And it's not even precisely documented. You can say help when the functions and not actually know what they're doing. Um, and some of the stuff is in Octave, but that's GPL. And a lot of people don't want to mess with that um, because they're, you know, they're making a plugin and, you know, they don't want to give all their source code with the plugin. Um, now, Python's really great and it's, in a, it's got a great license, but it doesn't have everything like it doesn't have in Freak Z. Um, and so that's something that I can fix, and so I did. Um, I implemented M-Freak-Z from scratch in Python, and that was interesting. I actually uh, pasted the algorithm description, uh, description from actually my thesis into Claude 3.5 Sonnet and just debugged the result, and wasn't that much to do. It was pretty straightforward, did really good. I was able to give it the LaTeX source. So I was pretty pretty happy with that. Um, so here's the actual um, you know web page, and so I have the LaTeX source for that, and and that worked out well. So um, that was really fast, <clears throat> um, and then I had to write unit tests, and um, it, it it really went well. So then um, here's the first prompt I use. I think this is an interesting thing to point out um, in the uh, uh, test program worked out nicely. And so if you go to the uh, fork of SciPy 
that I have on my website, my, my GitHub repo, you can see the um, the test programs and, um, and and run through the unit tests and, and see how it looks. Um, and so so that's uh, and here's a link to it. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, mfreqz.py. So this is my test program in my fork uh, where you can check it out. Okay, so um, I have to tell you this other one. This is a little bit on the side here because this is not in SciPy, but I also needed a spectral tilt filter. I like these uh, EQ photos. You just set the spectral slope, and uh, I have a paper on this. And so this is the abstract from it. And um, I think this is the heart of the abstract where it really says what it is. And I do try to write abstracts to be as complete and self-contained as possible. You should always do that. Um, a uniform exponential distribution of poles along the negative real axis of the S-plane with the zeros interleaving the poles. Arbitrary spectral slopes are obtained by sliding the array of zeros relative to the array of poles, where each array maintains a periodic space, a spacing on a log scale. It did it, and it did it really well, and it worked the first time. This was Claude 3.5 Sonnet, and I was amazed. And uh, um, here's the actual paper, uh, if you want to take a look. So this is what a spectral tilt filter looks like. You basically think of it as a Bode filter design, like used in classical control. If you know classical control, you know about these Bode stick diagrams for designing filters. Um, and so if you just switch them back and forth fast enough between poles and zeros, you'll get a nice smooth slope that's arbitrary. And um, it turns out that it's got a closed form representation, exponentially distributed on the negative real axis. So that turns out to be um, a very simple thing to specify, really. And so I um, figured we should write a paper on that. Um, and, I, and actually, you know, there's a good chance that that's in the training data. The whole paper's been online for many years. So, you know, this may not be as amazing as it appears. It may be an example of regurgitation, as they say, where you're actually, you know, accessing directly. Because I had implementations in MATLAB and in um, Faust. And so it could have been working from those under the hood. Who knows, right? And so sometimes people ask me why I like to write things in Python. This one, I, this is not coming from SciPy. Why would I need it in Python? Well, it's because um, it's a good starting point. You know, the test main block, um, you know, you can easily use all those NumPy, SciPy, and matplotlib functions to get your displays, look at your poles and zeros, look at your frequency response. It's just good signal processing development environment. Um, but there are other reasons, you know, um, chatbots have seen a lot of Python and it's a relatively simple language, so they tend to get it right. C++, I, I find them tripping, slipping and sliding all over the place. Um, they're, and, and chatbots are not good at signal processing yet. Even simple polynomial algebra trips them up. And, you know, it's well known that they uh, trip up on plain arithmetic. Uh, you know, so, so they're, they're, you know, they're just not, they didn't go to high school and learn all that. So they didn't work enough problems or whatever. And um, on low-level signal processing, they tend to get it wrong and, and give you toy things and, and just get confused. And um, I sympathize with some of the errors, you know, a lot of, you know, corner, you know, fence post errors, you know, the, not doing the right thing at the beginning or the end of the loop. And, you know, it's, it's fairly uh, re reasonable, the errors they get. But they're also hard to debug. You know, we don't like to uh, debug that stuff either. So um, so I try to push them to work on well-documented high-level APIs. And in, in Python does that. You know, who works with samples in Python, right? You've always got some scipy.signal function or something like that. And so it kind of forces the, uh, the, the chatbot to think in terms of function calls at a higher level where the functions are well-documented. And so that tends to work out better in my experience to date. And so, and then from a Python function to a C++ function, it's a much restrict, much more restricted C++ translation. It's like a, a very straightforward, you know, take this, you know, linear algebra function and implement it in Eigen. It, you know, C++, it will spontaneously think of using Eigen to do the algebra stuff, uh, you know, linear algebra stuff. And so that, that um I think is just a smoother path. It's a simpler path, and and it's in terms of the you know the best known language, which is a good idea. You want to stay close to the majority of the training data as much as you can, of course, obviously. <clears throat> okay, so um, so as I said, mfreqz is working, and um, and I have a SciPy fork that's going to become a pull request, and so you can go there now, um, and feel free to pile in and and uh, help me with it if you want, because the the thing I have to do now is integrate it. 
into uh, the filters um, function. So I'm also offering some new features, um, like a min face option, which I have to leave you know, false for the default, just to behave like everybody expects it. I don't want to break a lot of scripts that people expect to be able to, you know, port over unchanged. But it is a good idea to always set this true because uh, you really do want to be doing minimum. This is a phase sensitive um, equation error minimization. And so you do need minimum phase. And uh, stabilize is a good thing to do uh, just to make sure the filter is stable. It's not guaranteed by default, so you have to ask for it. And uh, now, in the uh, original FreakZ, in FreakZ, there was also an iterative thing added after me that ran Stiglitz McBride iterations. And, um, and in that case, it did do uh, stabilization. But the original was just equation error minimization, and it works best with minimum phase. And if you're going to stable, if you stabilize it, then it's more robust. And so those should both be set true. And the um, sequence McBride iterations I've implemented, but I don't like how the gain is floating up. I feel like there's probably a bug there, so I'm going to try to find that. Uh, I went ahead and threw in Prony's method because I like it a lot, use it a lot, and uh, the name is M Freak Z. The, the name is not inverse, you know, uh, it's not equation error filter design. So the name supports any method, right? And there are all sorts of new methods have been coming under the hood for the uh, iterative case. So why not the non-iterative case as well? So Prony's method, pod A Prony. And, um, and then if you look at the documentation for Infreq Z for the iterative case, um, uh, MATLAB says it uses a recursive Gauss-Newton iteration, which, you know, that, that's a well-known technique. It's probably the most common technique for um, online system identification. And it's basically Newton's method where you approximate the uh, second derivative matrix with the sum of outer products of the, uh, of the gradient. And, oh, that should be upside down. That should be a del, not a delta, a grad. Okay. But that, so, so that's something, but, you know, they don't really tell you what they do, and there's no paper cited. And I did implement this and didn't get exactly the same results. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm lukewarm about that. I don't really think I want to even bother with it. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do. So everything but Stieglitz McBride and Gauss Newton are passing their unit tests. And so I have to decide what to do and integrate it. I have to read filterdesign.py and really see how they're doing things. And, you know, you want to conform to exactly how everybody's writing code. And, you know, you know, you just try to, you know, do it the right way and then make a pull request. But right now it's in separate files with, with my name, sort of, you know, underbar JOS at the end. There's the test and then there's the non-test. And so that's where it is. And so... Um, so since Cloud uses these scipy.signal functions when it generates Python, we also need those. So um, these are the ones that I translated uh, using Claude. Claude translated them. And I did a little bit of debugging. And once in a while, I had to do some work. But almost always, it just worked right off the bat. And uh, it was interesting that for the polynomial roots case, it spontaneously used Eigen3, which uses the companion matrix method to um, find the roots. That was nice. It just worked. And um, so there's support for transfer function to pull zeros or back and transfer function to se second order sections. And um, and so there's the, these are just basic conversions between different filter forms. And then bilinear goes from analog to, um, in, to digital. And I really need that actually for the uh, spectral tilt filter because that designs in the S plane and I need to digitize. So I, I, do, you know, I do the closed form over the S plane uh, negative real axis and then, and then turn, and digitize it with bilinear and that looks good. And then you need this is your basic frequency scaling thing, low pass to low pass, changes the cutoff frequency, and um, and I'm very careful to ask for unit tests for every single translation. I go one function at a time, and I ask for a progressive series of unit tests, and you really need this, and you'll have to debug the unit test as well as the code sometimes, but you know you got to know that it's really working, and um, and so you just. Don't do this without doing unit tests. That, that's my conclusion. Now, maybe next year that won't be the case, right? Maybe we'll have some self-playing alpha zero type uh, software engineer that, that just gets everything right and it knows how to test itself and you know get it all right. Um, that's probably just a year away. We'll see. And then um, I'm going to put these in my modules on GitHub. And uh, it's... Uh, 
it's it's just what I really need. And uh, once once that's done, then maybe I'll think about, you know, especially if somebody else wants to help, do a, a complete, you know, scipy.signal.cpp. Um, the other scipy directory is in good shape. You know, FFTs, we've got lots of those. Linalg is covered pretty well by Eigen as far as what I've needed. So um, I'm really just focused on filter design and then more utilities and signal processing that um, support the Python-style stuff. All right, so that's it. Um, so we translated Python to C++ for real-time real use, and Claude helped a lot. I mean, it basically did, I would say, 80-something percent of the work and probably accelerated me by, I don't know, pretty close to 10x. Well, I'm going to say at least a solid order of magnitude. Really very, very happy uh, in general. But you do have to get your workflow down and figure out how to make it. Do, you don't want to ask for the wrong thing, right? Uh, it, it's easy to get wrapped around the axle and, and get screwed up and get into an iteration of translating a big program back and forth, you know, and then a line just disappears for no reason and, it, and you have to debug it. And it gives you back the program with a bunch of stuff elided and you've got ellipses, you have to catch every single time and you ask for diffs and the diffs are very buggy. It's not good at just telling you diffs. They're very, very error prone. So, you know, it's just so close to being fantastic. But, you know, if you focus your work workflow down, it can be fantastic. You just have to find that tunnel that works and then run with it. So they, they, they struggle at the low level, keep them away from the low level. And um, we've got some functions done and more to go. I'm kind of in the middle of that, that whole thing. And, um, and so I'm, I'm liking Python as an intermediate language, um, not only because it's so simple and confined in, on the way to C++ and leverages libraries that are good to leverage, but it also is uh, a test environment where you can you know, use, get your usual plots and see all the poles and zeros and analysis that you like to see. So... Um, and in Freak Z is available now in um, um, in my Python uh, SciPy fork. Oops, and the uh, uh, subset of SciPy.signal is going to go to GitHub in my modules, but I haven't pushed it yet just because I don't know. It's just a little bit of a mess. That's all. But if you're if anybody's in a hurry to get it, let me know, and you can translate it anything you need pretty fast. You know, the most main point is to show you that you you really can quickly go from Python to C++ and some of the you know you know, tips for best um, results um, are really the main point of this talk. <clears throat> but also, you know, what's available is available. Okay, that's it. So um, see you next time.